So good evening everybody. Yes, this is the science of Santa. Very much tongue-in-cheek and in the next half hour I'll take you through some of the reconciliation between the myth of Santa and the science behind it all. So the question I'm trying to deal with is this one. Is Santa compatible with the laws of physics? Or, to put it another way, just how many laws of physics does Santa actually break? So we know that Santa is, allegedly, a portly, jolly fellow with a white beard and a penchant for wearing red suits. And although that displays questionable fashion sense, that doesn't necessarily mean he doesn't exist. So what about the claims that are made about how he delivers presents to kids at Christmas time? He allegedly visits all households on Christmas Eve to deliver presents to all qualifying children. And here qualifying means defined by his, uh, his naughty nice list. So can we reconcile these incredible feats with our understanding of science? And when I'm delivering this talk, I make particular reference not only to just general science that we hope we understand, I talk about science that I've described in other talks that I've given. So I've got about 30 or so talks, there's half of them illustrated here, and I'm just going to pick out some of the science of these talks and see how that could be applied to our knowledge or our understanding of how Santa does what he does, allegedly. But perhaps before I kick off, let's start, if you do like cheesy jokes, then let's start with one of those. What is Santa's favourite element? Of all the elements in the periodic table here, we see the origin of these elements as to whether they were born in the Big Bang, or in stars, or in supernova. But perhaps you already know that Santa's favourite element is in fact element number 67. That's because it's Holmium. And there's Holmium down in the rare earths there. So yeah, okay, if that's the level of humour you like, then tough. We're not going to have any more jokes like this. We're going to move on to examining Santa's alleged feats. So this is the phrase I'm dealing with. Santa visits households on Christmas Eve to deliver presents to children. We're going to unpick that and ask virtually, word by word, whether or not that makes sense. So we'll start... In reverse order, we'll start with children. Santa visits households to deliver presents to children. Just how many children are involved? How many children get presents at Christmas? Well, if the Earth's population is about 8 billion and about 25% of the population are children, then we can imagine that maybe 50% of those are eligible for Christmas presents. We're not going to go into the details of culture and whether or not only Christians get Christmas presents. Let's just take it that it's about one billion children. And again, that's assuming a particular ratio of naughty to nice. Let's just assume there are no such things as naughty kids. They're all 100% nice. And we're assuming children all the way up to 18. Now, perhaps some 18-year-old children don't believe in Santa Claus, but that's their business. They are still eligible to get Christmas presents. OK, so what about Santa visiting all of these children? So how does he get around? What's the transport? Well, it's a sleigh pulled by reindeer. So we can ask the question, can reindeer fly? OK. Well, we know insects fly. Some insects fly. Birds fly. Pterosaurs fly, though you don't see so many of them these days. And of course, some mammals can fly as well. So if reindeers can fly, well, apparently they choose not to for most of the time. There's very little evidence that you can find anywhere for flying reindeer. But I'm a scientist, and so I believe that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So can reindeer fly? The answer is, I don't know. There's neither evidence for nor against it. it is so, if it is possible, we don't see it very often. So the jury is still out on whether reindeer can fly or not. How fast would Santa have to go in his sleigh in order to get around the world and deliver all these presents? Well, if he wants to visit a bil billion children in one night, which is about 36 hours, if you take advantage of the rotation of the Earth and the various time zones that he has to visit, he would have to travel at a minimum of 200, sorry, 2,000 kilometres per second. Now, that sounds quite fast, but it 
isn't. It's a tiny fraction of the speed of light. It is not even 1% of the speed of light. And so in a talk I give called Fiat Lux about the nature of light, we know that there is this speed limit of the speed of light, which is uh, 300,000 kilometers per second. So moving at this sort of speed, barely 1% of the speed of light, Santa isn't even close to breaking that particular speed limit. So there's no problem there. No object can move through space faster than light, but of course space can expand faster than that, which is why some galaxies are receding from us greater than the speed of light, because space can expand at any speed it wants to. It's only objects moving through space that are limited to this particular speed limit. Okay, what about roast reindeer? What about the fact that surely if he's moving fast the reindeer would burn up? Well, just like a meteor or an asteroid coming through the Earth's atmosphere, the air in front of the sleigh would be compressed at high speed and would heat up. A lot of people talk about objects moving through the atmosphere getting hot because of friction. Well, actually, it's not friction. It's compression of the air that produces the heating of objects moving through the atmosphere. And in a talk I give about stellar evolution, I talk about the ABC of stellar evolution, and the C stands for compression. Compression produces heat. When stars compress, the core of a star heats up. And so if Santa is moving through the atmosphere at high speed, we would expect the air in front of the sleigh to, to, to heat up. Now, an aerodynamic sleigh, okay, it doesn't necessarily look quite like that. Uh, aerodynamics would help a little bit, but you would still get this compression of air. You would still get things heating up. So doesn't that mean that the sleigh ought to be glowing absolutely white hot? If we take an ordinary object like this little USB flash drive, at 300 Kelvin, it just looks fine. But if we heated it up to a few thousand Kelvin, it would glow white hot. So isn't that what we would expect to see with Santa's sleigh moving through the sky? If compression produces heat and hot objects radiate light, then Santa and his sleigh ought to be easily visible. Well, maybe it was. Um, some people might argue that that's precisely what the Star of Bethlehem is. Well, if you can argue that the Father Christmas existed before Christmas, well, that's a little bit of a different logic to actually put together, so no, probably the Star of Bethlehem wasn't Santa in his sleigh. But of course there have been rather more recent sightings of lights in the sky, and maybe, again, another of my talks about UFOs uh, would possibly explain the existence of some of these lights in the sky, especially around Christmas time. But there's an alternative explanation, and a lot of what I have to say this evening has a lot of alternative explanations. Is there any type of material that we know about that does not emit or absorb or reflect light? Or indeed any other type of electromagnetic wave? Well, yes, of course there is a substance in the universe that doesn't absorb light or doesn't emit light. In fact, it's what most of the universe seems to be made of as far as matter is concerned, and that is dark matter. Dark matter doesn't absorb light, dark matter doesn't emit light. So if Santa and his sleigh are made of dark matter, then it doesn't matter if they get hot, if you'll excuse the pun, because if they get hot, then they are not going to emit light, and therefore Santa stays invisible. Also, it means that Santa's sleigh would not show up on radar, so we wouldn't see a dot moving backwards and forwards on all of the aircraft radar that are around the world monitoring aircraft movements, because, again, the sleigh would not absorb or reflect any radar signal, and hence would be in completely invisible. What about the next aspect? We've dealt with children, we've dealt with visits. What about households? What about Santa visiting various households? How does he get down so many chimneys? Well, not every house has a chimney, but let's ignore that for the moment. If we wanted to visit a billion children in one night, then according to the maths, he would have to squeeze down thousands of chimneys in each second. And looking at the picture of Santa, who tends to be a rather rotund individual, how on earth could he possibly fit down the chimney? Well, in his current state, that would be essentially impossible. But we know that atoms are mainly nothing. They're a nucleus surrounded by a lot of electrons. All we would need to do is replace the electrons with muons, which are similarly charged 
lightweight, relatively lightweight particles, a little bit heavier than electrons, but very similar in many respects. If we replace the electrons with muons, then all the atoms would be more than a hundred times smaller. So Santa, instead of being uh, a person best part of two metres high, would only be about a centimetre or so high. And he'd be able to fit down the chimneys no problem whatsoever. How exactly you replace all the muons with electrons or electrons with muons? Well, we can indeed, with our particle physics knowledge, see that muons can turn into electrons. So there's no reason in principle why Santa couldn't decide to change all his electrons into muons and then you would shrink down to a small enough size. But maybe that's not the only way it could happen because of course even if that was possible, it wouldn't help if the apartment or the house doesn't actually have a chimney. So how can Santa get inside a house or a dwelling if there's no access via chimneys? Well, the world of quantum mechanics comes to our rescue, because in quantum mechanics we learn that it is possible for objects to move through other so-called solid objects, because at the quantum level you could argue there's no such thing as solidity an object can move through a door or a wall, and so Santa, obeying the laws of quantum mechanics, could also move through a door or a wall, a locked window or a locked door, and happily get inside, appearing on the inside, having a beard on the outside. You don't have to open a window or open a door to get through. That's what quantum mechanics tells us. Quantum mechanics seems to go against common sense, but then so does Santa, so those two fit together very nicely. Let's have another look at the next aspect. Santa visits all of these households to give presents to children, and all of this happens on Christmas Eve. So how can Santa make so many deliveries all in one night? Even at relativistic speeds, in 36 hours, how can that be done? Well, Quantum mechanics comes to our rescue yet again. According to the rules of quantum mechanics, particles can be in two places at one time. So if that's true, why can't Santa be in two places at one time? And why should we limit it to two? Why can't Santa be in lots of places at the same time? This idea also helps the previous argument, Santa can actually be inside and outside the house at the same time. So you could argue he doesn't even need to tunnel through the windows or the door because he can be inside and outside at the same time. For those of you who know a little bit of quantum mechanics, this is the same argument as Schrodinger's cat, which is both dead and alive at the same time. If that's possible, then Santa can be inside and outside at the same time and in can, can indeed be inside and outside multiple houses at the same time. So no problem with doing all of that in just one night. If for some reason Santa could only be in one place at a time, then there would need to be some sort of alternative way of making the deliveries. And that would mean that Santa would have to be somehow capable of manipulating space and time. But so what? We know that's possible as well. Einstein tells us that space and time are not immutable. Both can be changed by the presence or the existence of mass. And so the existence of mass can change space and the existence of mass can change time. So why can't Santa change space and time to make it easier to visit all of these places in the 36 hours that he has been allotted? We've looked at visiting households in a particular time frame to a billion children, but also he has to take presents with him to give at least one present to every child. So how could Santa carry all of these presents? One present for each of one billion children. How could the sleigh hold that many presents? Well, is that impossible or is that just implausible? One option, we're coming back to again is Einstein saying that mass distorts space and time. So one solution is just to warp space in such a way that the sleigh is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. And that is perfectly reasonable because essentially 
any object that has mass at its centre, if you imagine a sphere with a mass at the centre, then the sphere is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. The extreme example of that is a black hole, where a black hole is very much larger on the inside than it is on the outside. So we know that's possible if we assume that black holes exist, and therefore distorting space and time could be one of Santa's tricks. There is an alternative if you don't like the idea of Santa distorting space in order to find enough volume to store all of the presents. Because we might live in a universe which only has three dimensions, left, right, forward, backwards, up and down. But many people believe that there are more than three dimensions, perhaps many more, perhaps more than a dozen dimensions. If that's true, then all Santa has to do is to store all of the presents in a different dimension and then that problem goes away. OK, we have a problem of how to get the presents into that dimension and how to get them out again. I don't know how to do that, but just because I don't know how to do it doesn't mean Santa doesn't. But you might say, it's all very well saying that all he needs to do is to make sure the sleigh is bigger on the inside and the outside. All he has to do is to move really fast. But surely all of these things, even though they're perhaps not impossible, wouldn't they need a huge amount of energy to achieve? If we've got, for instance, the sleigh and Santo and a billion presents moving at relativistic speeds, that would need an absolutely incredible amount of energy. Well, yes, it would. But maybe Santa has an incredible amount of energy at his disposal. For instance, why can't he power his sleigh with a black hole? If a black hole is enough to power a starship, why can't a black hole be enough to power a sleigh? If we work out how much energy he needs, he would only need a black hole about the size of an atom. A black hole of that size could not only power a starship, it could also power his sleigh by harnessing the radiation that the black hole would emit, the Hawking radiation that the black hole would emit. Let's face it, it only has to last one night, it's not like it has to last hundreds of years, and therefore a very small black hole will do the job very nicely. But there's an alternative. There's an energy source that we're overlooking here. It's the elephant in the room, and that is, what happens to all the mince pies? A lot of people leave a mince pie out for Santa. That's an awful lot of mince pies. What if Santa could convert the mass of all of these mince pies into energy? We know that E equals mc squared, so we can work out, knowing the mass of a mince pie, how much energy that could, in principle, give Santa to play with. So let's do a very small amount of maths. One mince pie, E equals mc squared, mass times the speed of light squared. The mass of a mince pie is about 50 grams or so. And the speed of light squared is a big number, so that 50 grams times speed of light squared comes out to be about 5 times 10 to the 15 joules of energy. How many mince pies would Santa have over the course of a night? Well, we don't know how many people leave mince pies. Let's assume it's just a few percent of all the households that he visits. If he's visiting a billion households and a few percent of them leave him one mince pie, then that means we've got about 20 million mince pies. So we work out the total amount of energy. It comes out that Santa has 10 to the power 23 joules to play with. Now, physicists are happy with joules. Most people don't really sort of have any feeling for how much energy that is. So let me tell you what that is in terms of something a little more down to earth. It's the same amount of energy that a nuclear power station would output over a time period of a million years. If it ran continuously 24-7, a nuclear power station running for a million years would generate that much energy. And in principle, Santa has that much energy in one day, providing he can extract all the energy from all the mince pies that he has left. But how do you extract E equals mc squared from a mince pie? Not necessarily very simple. One way, of course, is to take a mince pie 
and on the opposite side of the equation you take an anti-mince pie and you collide them together in the large mince pie collider at CERN. There are two problems with this idea, not least the fact that can you actually get a mince pie into the collider, but apart from that it's the fact that Santa needs to be all over the world. He can't spend all of his time in CERN unless you believe Santa can be in a billion different places at once, and again we're back to quantum mechanics there. But if you assume that he can't spend all of his time in CERN, then that's a problem. And of course the other problem is where you get all of the anti-mince pies from. So maybe this idea of mince pie, anti-mince pie collision giving you that extraction of energy, maybe that's um, rather implausible. But there is an alternative way of extracting a large fraction of the energy e equals mc squared. It's difficult to get all of e equals mc squared out of a mince pie, but there is a way that you can get most of it. It's one of the most efficient ways of extracting energy from matter. It's not the way you might think. You might think that stars are a very efficient way of taking matter and converting it into energy. For instance, it's keeping our sun burning for, what, 10 billion years or so. But actually, fusion is not the most efficient way of extracting energy. One of the most efficient ways of extracting energy from a lump of matter is to toss it into a black hole. And if the sleigh is driven by a black hole, then you have a black hole there to throw it into. If you drop a mince pie into a black hole, it will release energy. In the most extreme example, we can think of matter falling into a black hole called a quasar. Now, the matter in this case is probably not mince pies. The matter here is probably hydrogen gas or other stars. But matter falling into a supermassive black hole, which is what we call a quasar, that produces enormous amounts of energy. So much energy is released in the process of matter falling into a black hole that a quasar can be visible from enormous distances. For instance, in the talk I gave on ancient light, I describe how I photographed a quasar which is on the other side of the observable universe, some 25 billion light years away or so. But it is so bright, it is still visible and can be captured with a camera even without a telescope. This galaxy is 25 billion light years away, its light has taken 90% of the age of the universe to reach us, and this galaxy is receding from us at something like twice the speed of light. And yet it is so bright it's possible to photograph it without a telescope. That tells you just how efficient it is when matter falls into a black hole, just how much energy can be generated. Now I can't find any maths on how much energy you can get out of a mince pie being thrown into a black hole. I've tried researching this, but I can't find any scientific papers that have researched the topic of just how much energy is released when a mince pie falls into a black hole. It appears that very few people are actually working in this particular area of physics, though I can't really understand why. So we know it's possible. Getting the numbers is a little tricky. So you can ask the question quite sensibly, yeah, okay, it's possible. It's possible to distort space. It's possible to move at very high velocities. In principle, the energy required is vast, but yes, there are vast energy reserves, not least in mince pies. But how could Santa actually do all that? Yes, it may be possible. Very improbable, but yes, it could be possible. And this is allowed by the laws of physics. But how could Santa, for instance, manipulate space and time? Well, there's one thing you're forgetting, and that is, is there any reason why Santa actually has to be human? Is it not possible that distortions of space, manipulation of space and time, could be carried out by somebody who's not perhaps quite as human as we take him for? Do we actually know what Santa looks like? Does he have big ears and green skin? Well, given that not many people have actually seen Santa, then do we actually know what he looks like? Well, whether he's the size of Yoda and looking like Yoda, we don't perhaps know, but one reconstruction that can be done is what does Saint Nicholas look like? If you believe that Santa Claus is the same person as Saint Nicholas, well, Saint Nicholas, the, the Bishop uh, of, of 
uh, Myra in Turkey, has been reconstructed from a skull and using tissue information, the likeness of Saint Nick has been reconstructed. Now you might believe that that's what Santa Claus looks like, you might believe he looks a little bit more green than that with bigger ears. And of course even if that's what Santa Claus looks like, the standard depiction of Santa is a little bit different and perhaps a little bit closer to this sort of rendition. But the bottom line is, coming back to the first question I asked, just how many laws of physics does Santa break? And I think the answer is none. There is nothing he does which cannot be done according to the laws of physics. Santa is not impossible. He's simply rather improbable. So feel free to draw your own conclusions about the existence or otherwise of the portly jolly fellow with the white beard and a penchant for wearing red suits. Regardless of your conclusion, I'd like to wish you a Merry Christmas and thank you for listening.